Hey, I'm Rob Witcher, and I'm here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to cloud in Domain 3 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the fifth of nine videos for Domain 3. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Cloud computing. Everybody and their dog is moving their infrastructure, their applications, and their data to the cloud, and innovating with emerging technologies like AI and blockchain. Over the last 14 or so years, cloud has quickly become a massive part of most organizations' IT infrastructure, if not the dominant part. You would therefore expect that the CISSP exam would have a large percentage of questions dedicated to cloud, but that is not the case. You will certainly see questions related to cloud security on the exam. But the reason there is relatively few questions related to cloud security, despite its importance to organizations, is due to ISC Squared creating a separate certification focused on cloud security, the CCSP, Certified Cloud Security Professional. So let's go through some of the basics of cloud security you need to know for the CISSP exam. We'll begin with the three most common cloud service models, essentially the most common types of cloud computing. Infrastructure as a service is an environment where customers can deploy virtualized infrastructure, servers, appliances, storage, and network components, basically allowing a customer to recreate an entire physical data center as virtualized components, virtual firewalls, virtual routers, virtual servers, and so forth. Platform as a service provides the services and functionality for customers to develop and deploy custom applications. Customers can create their own applications without having to worry about all the underlying complexity like servers and the network and storage. And software as a service is where customers can rent access to an application hosted in the cloud. While likely not covered on the exam, let's look at containers as a service and serverless, or more aptly called functions as a service. Containers, and especially serverless, are becoming increasingly popular and have a lot of developer momentum behind them. So I think they're worth mentioning here. Containers as a service fits in between infrastructure as a service and platform. And serverless fits in between platform as a service and software as a service. For any flavor of cloud, it is critically important to understand who is responsible for what. If there's no clearly defined responsibilities as to who is doing what, you can generally assume no one is doing it. This diagram shows varying levels of who is responsible for what for the different service models. You should absolutely not memorize the specifics of what the customer is responsible for, the pink boxes, and the cloud service provider is responsible for, the purple boxes. Just know this. Responsibilities must be clearly identified and assigned, and the onus for doing this is on the customer. The customer ultimately remains accountable for the protection of any data and services they outsource to the cloud. So the customer must ensure responsibilities are clearly defined in contracts and service level agreements, and the customer must ensure that the cloud service provider has controls in place which are operating effectively to meet the defined requirements. This assurance can be provided through service level reports or more commonly via SOC 2 reports, which I talk about in the first mind map video for domain six, link in the description below. Now let's talk about cloud deployment models. Public cloud is cloud services that are available to anyone, to the public. A cloud service provider owns and operates cloud infrastructure that is open for use by the general public. Private cloud, on the other hand, is cloud infrastructure provisioned for exclusive use by a single customer. Private clouds can be owned and operated by the customer or by a cloud service provider. And private clouds may exist on or off premise. And private clouds can be physically or logically separated from one customer to the other. Honestly, it's pretty complicated, but the exam likely won't get into that complexity. So just remember that private cloud is reserved for one customer. Community cloud is cloud infrastructure that is only accessible by a small community of organizations or customers. They have similar shared concerns, similar security and regulatory requirements, for instance. And a hybrid cloud is simply some combination of public, private, and community cloud. For instance, it is very common for large organizations to have their own dedicated on-premise private cloud for sensitive data, and they also use the public cloud for less sensitive data and workloads. Thus, they have a hybrid model. 
And we're now going to spend a fair bit of time talking about identification, authentication, and authorization in the cloud. The use of cloud basically destroys the last vestiges of the formerly pervasive practice of organizations having well-defined perimeters and tightly controlling access to their trusted internal network. When an organization moves to the cloud, this concept of a trusted internal network essentially disappears. Identity is the new perimeter in the cloud. In the cloud, you should assume that all traffic is a potential threat. There is no trusted internal network anymore. Therefore, as security professionals, we must ensure that all traffic, all users are very thoroughly verified so we know exactly who is accessing what. This approach is often referred to as the zero trust model for security, and it requires very robust identification, authentication, and authorization controls. So let's dig into these controls by first talking about where we store users' identities. The two main places where we can store our users' identities are locally or in the cloud. Locally implies that some system, usually Active Directory, is being maintained by the organization on-premise in the organization's own data center to store user identities. And cloud obviously implies that a cloud service is being used to store an organization's users' identities. Okta is a good example of a cloud-based identity provider. Next, we have several options as to the types of identities that we can use. I talk about these in the second video for Domain 5, and I'm including them here again. A cloud identity is an identity which is created and managed solely in the cloud. Linked identities are two separate identities, one in the cloud and one local. There is simply some indication of a linkage between the two, but changes to one are not automatically synchronized to the other linked account. Synced identities are very similar. You have two identities, one in the cloud and one local. The key difference here is that these identities are synchronized. A change to one identity automatically is reflected, is synchronized in the other identity. And federated identities. A user has one identity that allows them to gain access to both local and cloud-based services via federated access. There are various protocols that can be used to enable identification, authentication, and authorization in the cloud. Service Provisioning Markup Language, SPML, is an XML-based framework for exchanging provisioning information, things like setup, change, and revocation of access, between cooperating organizations. Basically, SPML standardizes and simplifies the process of provisioning access across multiple systems in multiple organizations. The next three protocols all enable federated access. I talk about federated access in a lot more detail in the second video of Domain 5, Again, linked below. SAML, the Security Assertion Markup Language, is a protocol that provides both authentication and authorization in federated access. And SAML is very commonly on the exam, so make sure you understand it. OpenID provides only authentication. And OAuth provides only authorization capabilities. I've already mentioned that it is incredibly important to have clearly defined accountabilities and responsibilities in the cloud. Let's define these terms. Accountability refers to an individual who has ultimate ownership, answerability, blameworthiness, and liability for an asset. They are the owner of the asset. Accountability should be assigned to only one person for each asset, because ultimately, accountability means who is the throat that gets choked if something goes wrong. That is the accountable person. Accountability cannot be delegated. The accountable person can set the policies and requirements for protecting an asset and then delegate those responsibilities to others. Responsibility, therefore, means the doer, the person, or multiple people that are in charge of the requirements that were defined by the accountable person. Multiple people can be responsible and responsibility can be delegated. Let's now talk about the various common roles in the cloud and their accountabilities and or responsibilities. The cloud consumer is the customer the person or organization that is using, that is paying for cloud services. Individuals within the cloud consumer will be the owners, also known as data controllers, of any data that is stored in the cloud. And very importantly, the owners, the data controllers, will be accountable for the protection of any data they store and process in the cloud. And remember, the owner cannot delegate their accountability. They remain accountable even if they outsource data to a cloud provider. The cloud provider, also known as the processor, is of course the cloud service provider. 
the cloud provider will be responsible for protecting consumer data in the cloud based on the requirements set by the data owner. The cloud provider will be accountable for running their own infrastructure and protecting their own data. Cloud brokers are middlemen. Cloud brokers are organizations that exist between the consumer and the cloud service provider. And brokers exist to do things like aggregation, arbitrage, and intermediation. Essentially, they package together various cloud services for a consumer or add additional functionality to a cloud service provider's offering. And cloud auditors, rather obviously, are the people that no one likes because they show up to audit stuff and see if the controls are properly designed and operating effectively. By the way, I'm allowed to say that because I've conducted a lot of cloud audits and no one liked me when I did so. All right, what is a hypervisor? Hypervisors are software which allows multiple operating systems, virtual machines, to share the resources of a single hardware server, often referred to as a compute node. Hypervisors virtualize the components of a server. Hypervisors will create virtual CPUs, virtual RAM, virtual network cards, and they do this so that multiple operating systems can run simultaneously on a hardware server. You may see hypervisors referred to as VM monitors on the exam. Virtual machines are an emulation of a computer system. Virtual machines are essentially an operating system and some installed applications running on top of a hypervisor. You may see VMs referred to as instances or guests as well. When an organization decides to move some of their systems and data to the cloud, there is a lot they need to think about from a security perspective. How do they ensure proper access controls, confidentiality, availability and integrity of the data, portability, interoperability, reversibility, resiliency and compliance, among many other things. One way to tackle this problem is to take a data-centric view. Cloud consumers can focus on the data they plan to migrate to the cloud the classification of the data and therefore the security controls that need to be in place for each stage of the data lifecycle, creation, storage, use, sharing, archiving, and destruction. One important contractual tool that a cloud consumer can use to communicate their requirements to the cloud provider are SLAs, service level agreements. SLAs are documented commitments by the cloud service provider to a consumer, covering things like confidentiality, integrity, availability, responsiveness, and so forth. And SLAs are addendums to the overall contract. Conducting forensic investigations in the cloud, especially in the public cloud, introduces some significant challenges as well as some opportunities. One of the primary sources of evidence when conducting an investigation in the cloud is obtaining a copy of a VM instance or snapshot. A VM snapshot is a copy of a VM that preserves the state and data of a virtual machine at a specific point in time. Very useful for investigations. All right, one final interesting challenge I will talk about related to cloud, defensible data destruction. Many laws and regulations around the world require a data owner to ensure sensitive data, particularly personal data, is defensively, demonstrably destroyed. One possible method of defensively destroying data in the cloud is known as crypto shredding or crypto erase. The idea is that sensitive data is encrypted with an excellent algorithm like AES. And then every single copy of the encryption key must be physically destroyed. With no possibility of recovering the encryption key, the data has effectively been crypto shredded and is unrecoverable. Therefore, the data has been defensively destroyed. And that is an overview of cloud within Domain 3, covering the most critical concepts to know for the exam. If you found this video helpful, you can hit the thumbs up button. And if you want to be notified when we release additional videos in this mind map series, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications. I'll provide links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Thanks very much for watching and all the best in your studies.